should be coming. My talk today um, is part of a new project that I'm working on. Um, so I was thrilled to hear that the theme was cities. My new project is, uh, I'm a historian of the 12th and 13th centuries. For me, the most important centuries that have ever been. Uh, my, my previous work has been on laughter and humor, and particularly experimental politics in the 12th century. Uh, my new project, however, is looking at democracy. Um, this, this concept of democracy in the Middle Ages, not to look for the thing we know today as democracy in the Middle Ages, which I think might be a mistake, but instead to look at something unique and original, some unique political ideas in this period that I think may expand our definitions of what democracy has been and what it might be in the future. Part of this project is to look for the submerged strands of political thought in medieval life uh, in some strange places. And the strangest place, uh, in many ways, is, is paradise. So today's talk is going to be looking at paradise in the Middle Ages, a search for paradise in the 12th century, and particularly to ask this challenging question, was paradise ever used as a way to reframe political relations on Earth? Um, I begin with a simple question. I want you to picture it. What does paradise look like? What does paradise look like? We have concepts of this today. In the Middle Ages, there really were five answers to this question. Five answers. Uh, paradise could kind of look five ways. The first idea was that paradise was a garden, a perfect garden, located somewhere to the far east of China, often associated with the Garden of Eden. Second idea of paradise, B, was that it was an island, an island somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean that could be found again if you just had a good enough boat, you might find paradise. The third idea, the most maybe common sense idea for us, uh, but also the most crazy idea for medieval thinkers, was that it is a chain of stars, that paradise is a chain of celestial bodies from the moon reaching right up to the Empyrean, uh, the firmament, the highest firmament in the sky. The fourth idea, paradise is a mountain top. It is this perfect place at the top of the highest mountain. You know that all of these are kind of really inaccessible, which is of course the point. And the fifth idea, and the one I want to focus on today, is the idea of paradise as a city. A city in a cloud, but also a city that may descend to earth one day very soon. A future and coming heavenly city. Uh, the most popular idea in the Middle Ages was of paradise as a garden, the Garden of Eden that Adam and Eve had been expelled from, right? You know, after just six hours, that's the amount of time that humans spent in paradise, by the way. Theologians decided it was six hours. And the idea was that this walled garden of paradise could be found again. Um, and medieval uh, illustrators loved to draw pictures of this and imagine, you know, how much fruit would come off the trees and how perfect would the spring temperature be uh, in this garden of paradise. Um, for Rabanus Morris, in fact, the very word paradise itself means garden, uh, and he describes uh, paradise as a garden of delights, which mystically means both the present church and the church alive on earth. So, okay, paradise is a garden somewhere on earth, but it's also a state of being, uh, a metaphor for something to come. The island concept, some medieval thinkers really took this seriously. The, most, the, the one who took it most seriously of all was St. Brendan, the Irish monk in the 6th century who gathered 16 of his friends together and they went off in search of this island of paradise uh, and they were lost for, you know, something like six months. It's a crazy journey. Um, they end up finding the island of paradise but it is covered in dark smoke. And only through prayer does Brendan finally get to see this, this spectral vision of what this island of paradise is like. But then he forgets everything and goes home. Medieval map makers, I should tell you, took this seriously that paradise was somewhere out there. We could find it if only we look hard enough. This is the Hereford map of Mundi. Right at the top, you see a map of the world, which I should say includes like uh, Britain and Italy. And, you know, it's, it's geographically kind of accurate, at least in Europe. It gets less so up here. Russia, incidentally, on this map is represented by a bear, uh, even in the 13th century. Uh, but right at the top of this geographically fairly accurate map is the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve being expelled from paradise. Sorry about the blurry image. 
even really kind of accurate map makers try to make paradise part of the plan of, of the world. You know, this is a map designed for sailors, these straight lines guiding their way uh, through the Atlantic. And here is, again, the island of paradise represented. Because, you know, if you were near it, you would want to check it out, wouldn't you, if you were using a map to navigate? But the, the figure of paradise that I want to focus on most of all is the idea of paradise as a city, an eternal city on the one hand, a spectral city in a cloud, but as I say, also a city that may come to earth. These images of paradise as a city really proliferate. They really multiply in the 12th century, which is no coincidence, precisely at the time that Europe is beginning to urbanize again after four or 500 years of decay after the Roman Empire. So as cities become like the major way of living again in Europe, it's no coincidence that paradise comes to be seen as a city again. Um, this idea of paradise as a city has the oldest origins. This is based on the book of Revelation, um, John's vision of a city which descends upon the earth. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So this is the oldest idea. And like I've already said, a lot of people took this just as a metaphor. Okay, the coming city of heaven will just be what we feel in our hearts. But others saw it as literal. A cloud will descend to the earth and this city will be there. Um, we have visions of monks and others who claim to have visited this paradise city, uh, you know, before, before, like, you know, before they die, this vision of the heavenly city. The monk of Esham is one in the 1190s. He describes this dazzling city that he saw. He fell into a coma uh, and everyone tried to revive him for like two weeks, but he wouldn't wake up. And then he woke up and he described this city that he had seen. He believed he had traveled to it bodily. I saw what appeared to be a wall of crystal. How glittering was the inconceivable brightness. How strong was the light that filled those places. My favorite vision, though, is probably the vision of Gottschalk. It's interesting because he was not a monk. He was not a bishop or a churchman. This was an ordinary man. He was a soldier. He was a peasant from Saxony. And he also fell into a coma. And when he revived, just after Christmas, in I think it was 11, 1190, uh, he awoke and described his vision. And his vision is interesting because it's also a vision of a city, but for me, it's much more realistic. It's much more like the cities that he would have seen being built on earth in his own time. I saw an infinitely large city in a wide plain without ramparts, ditches and ring wall. The city was open to everyone. He describes the city getting bigger and bigger the closer to, to God you get. So more built up is this city of paradise. It's curious because I've already said there's a blurring of the reality of this city. Some architects in the 12th and 13th centuries take this idea literally that they, by building a new cathedral or a new castle, are actually building the physical buildings of the new Jerusalem on earth, of, of paradise, the city on earth. Uh, here's an image of uh, a tapestry. You can see this is actually um, John's vision from the book of Revelation. And notice the city that comes out of the cloud looks remarkably like the Gothic castles that they're building at the very same time. Equally, uh, we have descriptions of the heavenly city uh, with cloisters and, and flying buttresses and gothic arches and all kinds of architectural features which we can see depicted on, for example, this first uh, illustration of Paris that you can see Notre Dame that survives from medieval art. Okay, so my question, though, with all of these cities is, did they serve as any kind of political paradigm? Was there a way in which these visions and descriptions of the perfect city which was coming to earth, which you may even be building now, was that ever used as a political tool to try and change the way city life worked uh, in the 12th century? And my tentative answer is yes. The work of Giorgio Agamben, uh, the Italian philosopher who's just published a fantastic book on paradise as garden, Il Regno e Il Giardino, um, for Gambon, the answer is no. Paradise is not a, a paradigm uh, for politics in the Middle Ages, but I would argue it is precisely if we look at the city as location of paradise rather than the garden, as he does. Um, 
What does this society of the heavenly city look like? This is my guiding question. Can we see certain assumptions and values embedded in these descriptions of how the society functions? St. Augustine, the, the, um, the founding father of medieval Christianity, right? All roads lead to Augustine. If you ever want to think about any topic in Christian history, Augustine has already thought about it and written hundreds of words on the topic. Um, he wrote about the heavenly city in a very interesting way. His vision of the heavenly city essentially was one of inclusivity and peace. Here's his description of the city of God as it would manifest on earth. Uh, this heavenly city uh, calls citizens out of all nations. It is an international city. And gathers together a society of pilgrims of all languages. It is a multilingual city, not scrupling about diversities in the manners, laws, and institutions uh, whereby peace is secured. It's a peaceful city. It's a, multi, a multilingual city, a multicultural city. Uh, one based on some pretty fundamental values which we might even call kind of universal human values of peace and justice. Incidentally, that's a great value for someone like Augustine himself, an Algerian uh, theologian who, who considered himself a citizen of the world. Bishop Otto of Freising offers a very, very different vision of what uh, this perfect city might look like. Otto is a, is a bishop from the 12th century, uh, he's a Cistercian monk, but he's also the uncle of the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. So he is one of the most powerful figures in 12th century Europe. I think he fancies himself, he believes himself to be a great literary mind as well. He writes a history of the world which takes in everything that ever happened from the birth of humanity to the end of the world. And of course he includes his own nephew in that story. He writes about the coming apocalypse as if it had already happened. This is a book that was supposed to last into infinity. It was the total history of the world. And for Otto, describing paradise and the coming heaven is very interesting. What does it look like for Otto? It is not the multilingual, multicultural, multi-ethnic world imagined by Augustine. It is quite the opposite. It is a place where all defects are taken out of bodies, but the natural state of bodies is preserved in a life that ought to be free from every blemish and every spot. For Otto, if you are short, you will become exactly six foot tall. If you are six foot five, you will become exactly six foot tall. If you are fat, you will be exactly 75 kilos. If you're thin, you'll become exactly 75 kilos. Everyone will look the same. He even describes Ethiopians losing their, um, what's it, he, losing their blackness. He calls it their unsightly pigmentation. Everyone will look the same. Paradise is a place of total uniformity. Perfection brings about utter <laughs> sameness. This was Otto's vision of paradise. Maybe it's slightly horrifying. I don't know. An alternative, and very much the yang to Otto's yin, is Anselm of Havelberg, who is a great theologian of diversity. This is a man who wanted to change the Christian church, root and branch. He wanted to make a brand new Christianity. And for Anselm, part of that process was destroying the kind of traditional mindset that represented by someone like Otto. For Anselm, you needed to make a space to say things can change, people can be different, and that can still be good Christianity. And this manifested in his vision of the coming paradise. Unsurprisingly, for Anselm, the coming paradise uh, will host a variety of blessed souls reflecting the fragility of the human race and the changing of times from generation to generation. It will be full of all sorts of different people looking very different, acting very different, even practicing different kinds of Christian living, but it will still be paradise because this diversity for Anselm is essential uh, to the human condition. How would the heavenly city function? How would it actually work on a daily basis? If it's a city, will it still act like a city? Will there be industry? Will there be employment? Will there be trade? You know, this is an interesting question. And you'd think the answer was simple, but it's, but it's not. Um, one guy, Bernard of Cluny, who is another monk, in the 1140s writes this vision. It's not clear whether he had this vision or somebody else had the vision or whether he made it up, but it's another vision of paradise as city, and it is fascinating. And I wonder if it sounds like any cities. It's, this is not Jimin, um, but it's a city without business, without time, and without aspiration. I, I've never lived in a city like that. 
for, for, for Bernard of Clooney, right, paradise is static. It's like nothing. It's, like, it's a retirement community right, where nothing changes. There need be no business because everything is just perfect as it is. There's no time. There's no, he says without business, the Latin word is negotia. There's nothing to negotiate in paradise. Time has stopped. By contrast, I get, maybe this is Moscow, I don't know. <laughs> um, Honorius of Autan um, describes a thronging multitude of handsome men and women, uh, admiring resplendent buildings. It's definitely what I saw today walking around. And possessing, and this is the interesting part for me, this is the really controversial part. Possessing lots of money and an array of fine things. That word in Latin, fine things, is, is actually furnishings. I just couldn't bring myself to write furniture because it's so odd, um, and it kind of could be translated either way. So paradise for, for, for Honorius, this guy is like this hugely popular preacher in the 1100s, hugely popular, and he tries to make Christianity exciting and accessible. But for him, paradise, right, it's not a retirement community where time has stopped in total beauty. Instead, it is very much a living city. Paradise is a living city just like this, so we should all get used to it, I suppose. Um, and there is money, which of course suggests that there must be something to exchange. Does that mean everyone's equal in paradise? It's basically some kind of trade capital system. But there's one, there are four commonalities, I would say, in how this city is described, because all the visions, and I, I've read many of these visions, and you, these, these features keep coming back over and over again. First of all, I hope you like choral singing, because that will be the key feature of these cities, choral harmony. It is the constant singing together. And I believe this is important, actually, as a feature of paradise as imagined as a political community, because it's a symbol of harmony that these medieval writers all imagine. But, of course, like choral harmony in this period, where counterpoint is being developed um, in this period in the Middle Ages, it is something that allows for a diversity of voices, uh, but, as long as, but blending them together in one coherent whole. So this harmony... Uh, there is a hierarchy of privilege in paradise. This is curious. Um, in John's Gospel, it had been described that you know, the Lord's house has many mansions. And theologians spend hours debating this. Like, okay, so if there are many mansions in paradise, are they all the same size? D does that mean some people have a better place in paradise to live? You know, some people have two toilets, some have one. Um, that's a joke. There's no toilet in paradise, as you know, because there's no digestion. This has been solved. Um, but there's a hierarchy of privilege, right? The many mansions mean there's different kinds of rewards for different kinds of people. Um, but there is a mixing of classes. They all mention this, all these visions of paradise, even Otto's, which was like about harmonizing everyone into the same body. He still respects the fact that there are many different walks of life represented in paradise. And finally, and the most enigmatic, paradise has walls. It has walls. There's only one vision that doesn't describe that, and that's the vision of the peasant, uh, Gottschalk of Saxony. His city has no walls. But all of the others have walls, which is curious. Walls to keep people out, walls to keep people in. Walls against what in this paradise? I'll have to solve that one another, another time. But um, The next key question, of course, the, the million dollar question is, will this city appear on Earth? So paradise is a perfect city. It's out there somewhere in the ether. Will it physically appear on Earth? Of course, there's one monk who takes this extremely far, and for whom the answer is 1,000% yes. His name is Joachim of Fiore, an Italian monk. Uh, this is his, <laughs> incidentally, this is Antichrist here. This is the beast of uh, the book of Revelation, who will come to destroy us all. And his seven heads, um, medieval theologians like to play games. Who's, the, who's going to be the seventh head of Antichrist? Will it be the Emperor Barbarossa and so on? Uh, for Joachim, right, humanity, the history of humanity can be divided into three sections of time. Um, the time of the Old Testament, the time of the New Testament, and the time of the, of the, of the Testament that is still to be written. At the age of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. For Joachim of Fiore, this time of the, of the Holy Spirit will be a time of millennium, a time of paradise on earth, and it's coming. And for Joachim, it was definitely coming, without any questions, in the year 1260. Uh, he, I mean, 
he obviously wasn't quite right, but he'd done the mathematics. He, it, it, was an, it was a wonderful mathematical schema. And in this red zone, at this time of paradise on earth, everything will be destroyed and the new cities will be built then. And these will be the cities of the blessed elect who will you know, rise out of their coffins. All the dead blessed will rise out of their coffins and enjoy in their physical bodies a paradise on earth and this new city will be built. Um, but let's go back to Otto. Let's go back to that guy, Bishop Otto of Freising, the nephew of, um, or the uncle rather, of the Emperor of Germany, um, the great writer. For Otto, it's quite interesting, because at first he says, no, the city will never come to earth, right? It's only a metaphor. And he says, you know, it's like gold. You know, gold, is, it's nice to own gold, but what's better than owning gold is, is what gold signifies, which is eternity, things that do not tarnish, right? He, so he makes this big argument that it's, it's better to never have paradise on earth, but to have the symbol of paradise on earth. But, which, you know, it's debatable, isn't it? But Otto then kind of backtracks and he starts to sort of, he allows the possibility that this paradise city is coming. Uh, and he describes it this way, and I just love this description. Um, the city, therefore, is said to come down out of heaven because by a mysterious ordering of the divine plan, uh, it will come to the notice of the elect, not only by knowledge, but also by experience. Let me explain. The city is coming to earth, but it won't be so obvious. It won't be like a city coming out of a cloud. It will be a gradual process where people who understand these sorts of things, people with superior perception, will come to recognize that they're already living in paradise. It's a subtle process where the world that we know is gradually transformed morally to become more and more like paradise every day, this city, this coming city. And he describes this in interesting terms. Some of these dwelling in cities, in castles, in villages, in the countryside, impart to their neighbors by word and example the rule of right living. In other words, in this coming paradise, the, it, it will be the, the agents of this coming paradise will be the individual citizens themselves. People notice from a vast different backgrounds, right? People from villages, castles, cities, countryside. He's deliberately saying these people from all corners of, of the social world. They are going to become the agents of paradise. It will not be great theologians telling you how to live. It will be people telling each other because there is a moral revolution coming which will produce paradise on earth. And of course, this is where love comes into the dimension. They will mutually correct one another in love. Love for Otto is going to be the force that's going to bring about this paradise in people's lives on earth. So let's get down to that difficult question then, that idea of a city of love. And this idea that you could create a perfect political community through an ethics of love and what that looks like. I'm aware that this might sound particularly spacey, as we say, or, um, you know, Hip, a hippie, we, we might say, you know, this is an idea like, oh, well, free love, you know, create this mentality of loving one another and we'll have a revolution. It's quite specific for medieval thinkers. And it goes back to this man, really, who, Bernard of Clairvaux, if you, if you haven't come across him, I mean, he was the, the dominant figure of 12th century life in all spheres. Uh, he was... Um, he was essentially a politician and, and you know, he, he was more of a politician. He was a more powerful politician than the Holy Roman Emperor. And he was a more powerful religious figure than the Pope. But he was just an abbot of an, a small abbey in the Champagne region of France called Clairvaux. Um, uh, and Bernard is the greatest, I think, philosopher of love there has ever been. He wrote extensively on the topic. He, wrote, he produced a sermon every single week uh, on the Song of Songs about love, right? About love in the Bible. He wrote a work called On Loving God, which was specifically about this topic. And for Bernard, the process of, of love and, and it's, what it does to the individual is curious. And he uses the analogy of wine. He says... As a drop of water seems to disappear completely in a big quantity of wine, with the highest love, all human feelings will melt in a mysterious way and flow into the will of God. Love for Bernard of Clairvaux is always about love of God. 
He says that love of God is the only love that can be quenched. All other love cannot be quenched. The object of desire is elusive. It's impossible to fully attain, achieve, and, and sublimate oneself in any other kind of love. All other love leads to tragedy and pain and, and loss. But love of God is that which transforms the self uh, and takes oneself out of oneself to a place of sublime, mystical ecstasy, which can happen in the current life. It is a science of love, more than just the poetics of love. And this was all practiced in Bernard's monastic community of, of Clairvaux, the Cistercian monastic network. And Otto of Freising himself, Bishop Otto, was a Cistercian, a follower of St. Bernard of Clairvaux. And these were, I believe, laboratories of this kind of paradise on earth. These monasteries were laboratories of what a coming city of love might look like. Um, Bernard describes how uh, this kingdom, he's talking about paradise now, is not yet fully established among us. Nevertheless, every day, little by little, it draws near, and with sensible increase are its borders daily extended. Again, like Otto, so in other words, paradise is coming, its borders are extending, but like Otto, um, it will at least come in those whose inward man is, um, is by the help of God renewed from day to day. Like Otto, this is again a process of the individual coming to understand and perceive that they are living in paradise. Uh, and these monasteries, as I say, were designed to produce that experience for his fellow monks. He says that Clairvaux itself, his monastery itself, is Jerusalem. It is paradise already. But not the earthly Jerusalem to which Mount Sinai in Arabia is joined, uh, but the free Jerusalem which is above and the mother of us all. For Bernard, he was already living in the city of paradise. It had come, it was a monastery, a monastery where he and his monks would practice a kind of divine, mystical love. Um, and this is where I'll finish with, uh, with Dante Alighieri. Okay, so these monasteries, it's great, but of course they're just micro-communities. It's just a series of men living together, practicing like this perfect city uh, based on the principle of love and mutual correction. But... I believe that with someone like Dante Alighieri, we get this idea sublimated and produced into something that looks much more like an actionable political paradigm of a city on earth. Uh, Dante, you, you're probably familiar with Dante. You, you may know about Dante's paradise, which of course is something which is achieved uh, at the top of Mount Purgatory. At the, top, uh, the soul makes his way up Mount Purgatory, purging all of his seven deadly sins until he arrives at the, the perfect garden of paradise and then takes off into the stars. Dante, basically all of the kinds of paradise are all blended in Dante's vision. They're all there, all five of them. Um, and there you go. Paradise is really then a chain of stars leading up to the firmament. And for Dante, who is at the top of paradise but Bernard of Clairvaux himself, the arch practitioner of love. And to see that final heavenly city uh, and to see the face of God, Bernard gives them a prayer in love. Bernard is, of course, a gooseberry here. Dante's journey to, to God and perfect love has been also the journey to find his lover, his dead lover, Beatrice, uh, who is at the top of heaven and leads Dante through paradise all the way up. Bernard gets involved, uh, and the three of them finally get to the top to see God. And Bernard says... He makes a prayer, I burn for this, disperse all the clouds of mortality and let the highest beauty be displayed to him. And Dante finally perceives God. And of course, this is a vision of love. And the final words of, of Paradiso, of Dante's Paradiso, my exalted vision lost its power, but now my will and desire like wheels revolving with an even motion were turning with the love that moves the sun and all the other stars. For Dante, this love that moves the universe was directly translatable to that city of heaven. And as prophet, Dante himself, as the pilgrim who had seen paradise and come back to tell the story, was the one who was meant, through the ethics of his text, to teach people how to live this perfect political community on earth and how to live it through the ethics of love, which we can trace back through Bernard and the 12th century monks. And this, I believe, and I will end here, explains the difference between a medieval city, or ideal city, which I believe corresponds to these principles of mutual love, 
uh, annihilating the self in perfect loving community and the Renaissance vision of the ideal city, which as you will see is, uh, is rather sterile by comparison. Okay, thank you so much for listening. I look forward to some questions. Okay.